lot of work on the dark universe. I wonder if you could explain what this means to you or what it is. <laughs> so the, the dark side of the universe, this is my um, area of research. Um, I wonder if we call it that just because we're all Star Wars nuts at heart. <laughs> the influence of sci-fi. Um, but we, yeah, the influence of wonderful sci-fi. But we, basically, about 95% of the universe we don't understand. And we, we use this term, the dark universe, to describe that part of the universe. The other 5% is the stuff that you and I are made up of, and the Earth and the Moon and the Sun and, and everything we can see. This other 95%, we, we call it dark um, because it's mysterious and we don't understand it. And there are two entities on the dark side. There's something that we call dark matter. That's about a quarter of the universe. And then something that we're going to call dark energy, which is about 75% of the universe. Uh, we don't understand either. But it's very exciting because when you don't understand something that big, <laughs> like 95% of the universe, it means you're missing something. You're missing a key piece of the puzzle. And so that's the fun and exciting bit is trying to work out what it is we're missing. Why don't we understand what we can see out there in the universe? And how was it first sort of discovered that there's this sort of 95% unaccounted for? Yeah, part? so we're talking about the two different parts. So the, the dark matter side of things, uh, that happened back in the 1930s. Um, a guy called uh, Fritz Vicky was looking at how fast uh, galaxies were moving around. Um, so let's see, I want you to imagine, embrace your inner cowgirl, and I want you to imagine you're spinning something around your head, okay? The faster you spin something, the tighter you have to hold on to it. Yeah, okay. So he was looking about how fast these galaxies were moving around and uh, they were just moving too fast for the gravity to hold them all together. So when you're spinning something around your head, it's the, the string that's keeping it attached. But out in the universe, when things are moving around, it's gravity that's keeping things together. So Fritz Wicke said, there must be additional stuff out there that I can't see. He was German, so he called it Dunkel Material, which translates as dark matter. Everyone thought he was completely insane. Now then the fabulous Vera Rubin, an amazing um, astrophysicist, she came along and did some really, really detailed, detailed experiments where she measured this same effect in galaxies. Uh, everyone also thought she was mad, but because her experiments were so meticulous and so perfect, um, it became really understood that indeed around every galaxy there's a massive clump of, of dark matter. So that was in the sort of 70s, 80s. So that was the first component of the dark universe. Now let's move forward to uh, 1998, where uh, people were looking at distant galaxies. Now we've known since the 1920s that the universe is expanding. So the further you look away in the universe, all these galaxies are moving away from us. But in 1998, they realized that the galaxies that are even further away were moving away faster. So not only is our universe growing, but the rate of that growth is getting faster and faster. Um, and I think because Fritz Vicky back in the 30s called this extra matter that was needed dark matter, we ended up calling this extra energy that's needed to power this expansion dark energy. But I, I think it's really just because we're all Star Wars nuts and we like to say dark matter and dark energy. <laughs> it's quite inspiring. <laughs> there you go. That's the dark universe in a nutshell. And where has your work taken you? Yeah, so um, I look at both of these entities. Um, so my uh, thing that I'm probably most well known of is for making maps of the dark matter. So it's completely invisible, you can't see it, but you can tell that it's there because of the effect that it has on the things that we can see. Um, so Einstein in his theory of general relativity said that if you have a clump of matter, um, it will curve the entirety of space-time so uh, imagine you're the observer on Earth with a telescope looking up at me, a distant galaxy. If a big clump of dark matter was in between us, it would distort the way my face looked. And that's just because the whole of space and time has been distorted. And that's the technique that I use to map out where all the dark matter is. Uh, so that was sort of my early work. And now I've been using that to also tell me about dark energy. Because dark matter and dark energy kind of one up each other in the universe. So dark matter is trying to pull everything together. It's like the strong gravitational force that pulls everything together. And because dark energy is causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate, it makes it ever harder for dark matter to pull those structures together. So by mapping out where all the dark matter is and how that changes and evolves with time, then I can tell you, I can confront various different theories about what could be causing this dark energy. So yeah, my job is to collect the data, extract as much information as we can from it and then confront all of these 
wonderfully varied and wild different theories on what could make up this dark side of our universe. So you work from the data rather than theory based? I am not a theorist. Well, I don't, know if, uh, I don't think you can ever do the two independently. So my work is always driven by what the theories are predicting. Like, um, I don't think there's any point in coming up with a theory that doesn't have something that you can predict that's observable from it. There's, there's not really much point in coming up with a theory if you can never test it. Um, so I look at the, the theories that people are coming up with. I think, how can we actually test this? What data do we need to test this? Um, and over my career, we've worked with various different telescopes, different instruments to build up the data that we need to test these different theories. Um, and we're even going so far as testing Einstein's theory of general relativity itself. So this, text, this technique relies on Einstein's theory of general relativity. Um, so we can use this data to actually test the theory of gravity itself. Okay, so does this have implications for Einstein's theory of general um, so relativity? So, you know, I, 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 I skip up, to, I work on top of a hill, we're in an observatory, so we're on top of a hill, and I, I, I genuinely love my work, and I skip up the hill every day, and ah, will I prove Einstein wrong today? Um, no, not yet. So the more and more data we collect, the, 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 the smaller errors we get, so the, the more precise the measurements become. And everything we do just comes back as exactly what Einstein predicted. But soon, soon, we will have the most amazing data set and maybe we'll prove them wrong, who knows? Um, but it's exciting just trying to, trying to look and decide what's, yeah, what could be out there. Why would that help if you could disprove uh so uh, when I was talking about uh, Vera Rubin uh, discovering this dark matter around galaxies and I was talking about spinning this thing around my head, okay, so it's, it's gravity that's holding everything together, whereas the thing spinning around my head, it's the string. Okay. So if our theory of gravity is wrong, then you don't need to invent this additional dark matter particle. So I should say, you know, that this is all theory that I'm talking about, this dark matter and dark energy. These are names that we use to describe entities that we believe are there, but we have no um, direct proof of the existence of a dark matter particle, and we really have no understanding of where this additional energy source of the universe has come from. Um, so one good theory to explain the dark matter particle is something called supersymmetric theory, um, which comes from particle physics. But the simplest supersymmetric theory model suggests that the Large Hadron Collider in CERN should have already created some of these dark matter particles. And so that's putting that theory into some level of trouble. I mean, it's a very flexible theory, so it's not, not dead in the water yet. Um, but I, I think over the next 10 years, uh, I'm going to say 20 years, if the particle physicists don't discover a dark matter particle, then I will start getting increasingly worried about as astronomers, we need this, this dark matter component in our universe to understand the observations that we make. Um, and as I say, all the tests I've done of Einstein's theory of general relativity so far have, have come back. I mean, it is the best tested theory that we have, it, and it works beautifully. Your, your sat nav wouldn't work if you didn't understand, or well, you don't have to understand it, but <laughs> if engineers and scientists didn't understand Einstein's theory of general relativity, your sat nav wouldn't work. So we, we, we know this theory works well, but maybe it works differently um, in different parts of the universe. Uh, these are things that we can test. I, I, I think it probably will work fine, but we can test it, and that's the important thing. So you're not taken in by the sort of grand uh, theory of supersymmetry? Um, so supersymmetry has lots of uh, l elegance. <laughs> um, so it's allows one to unify the three forces that uh, impact particles on, well, ah, that's a fly. <laughs> that's what being like by the river is. Um, <laughs> uh, so there are three forces, there are four forces in the universe. There's gravity, which is uh, sort of off on one side, and then we have the electromagnetic strong and weak forces. And supersymmetry allows you to understand how those three forces kind of work together. How back in the, um, in the very hot, environments of the early universe right after the Big Bang, how those three would have been very similar. And that uh, gives us a, a good understanding of where those forces are coming from. Um, and then one can go to the next step of how do we 
unite gravity in as well. So it's a, a beautifully elegant theory, and I think that's why people have spent so much time working on it. Um, I like the theory because it gives me uh, a, a good theoretical grounding for what the dark matter particle will be, which is you know, what I'm particularly interested in. And it's genuinely disappointing that it hasn't been realised at CERN yet. I mean, how exciting would it be if they actually found one? It's so exciting. <laughs> And moving on to your work that's covered the multiverse. Yes. Does this link towards this? So uh, the multiverse is a really interesting extension of um, what we call inflation theory. Um, so right after the Big Bang, um, the majority of um, theories about how our universe was formed requires a very rapid period of inflation in the very, very early universe. Um, and there are many, many different models for how this very rapid period of inflation could have occurred. But the majority of these models are called chaotic inflation theory models. And they predict that not just one universe would be created, that multiple universes would be created. Um, and this lends itself to the, to the idea of there being a, a multiverse. Um, you can kind of, I, I like to imagine, um, blowing bubbles, and there just being lots of bubbles of different shapes and different sizes around. That's kind of your this this idea of there being multiple universes in in space. Um, when I first started thinking about the multiverse, I really didn't like it because I thought uh, this isn't a theory I can test because I I physically can't see anything outside my own observable universe. Um, and uh, I think I said at the at the start, there's no point in coming up with a theory if you can't test it. Um, but actually, we can test these theories of inflation. So if we, we, can, we can test theories, and if they make a prediction that a multiverse is the consequence of that theory, then that's a great way of actually testing this idea of, of there being multiple universes out there. Um, so we can test these inflation theories. Um, in the very early universe, when the, the universe experienced this period of rapid inflation, that would imprint um, gravitational waves. So it's an incredibly um, powerful event that you should still be able to see the ripples of now in, uh, in gravitational waves. Now, there's been the first detection of gravitational waves recently. Um, this is not my area of work. It's absolutely phenomenal what these scientists have managed to do. And so it's just giving them time now to improve their instrumentation, their technology, so we can get down to the sort of levels where we'll be able to see the remnants of this rapid period of inflation. And then you can really test these models. Are these chaotic inflation models the way to go? Does that? really infer that there are multiple universes out there. And so what would be your next research project? My next research project is super duper exciting. Uh, it's called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. Um, it is a, a 10 meter telescope in a uh, mountaintop in Chile, in the Atacama Desert. It is one of the driest places in the world. If you ever go there, you're like constantly putting Vaseline on your lips. <laughs> it's so dry. Um, and that's because you want your telescope to always be able to see the heavens, so there's the, you're, you're either above the clouds or there are no clouds to be had. Oh, it's the most amazing sight um, when you're there. If you go out at night and let your eyes get dark adapted, it takes about 10 minutes. Um, and you look up at the night sky, it, it's bright. <laughs> it's the funniest thing because everywhere you look, there are stars because it's just that clear and that dark. And just, if you let your eyes adapt, you can just see stars everywhere. Uh, it's the most amazing sight. Now, this telescope is going to be surveying the universe. For, for 10 years, it's going to do nothing else, just take image the sky, image the sky, do it again and again and again, and you build up that really deep image. So we're going to be looking back to the universe um, only a couple of billion years after the Big Bang. We're going to be able to look that far back. Um, also, this technique of just looking again and again, night after night, we're also going to be able to see things that move. Uh, so we're going to find the killer asteroids that might one day obliterate planet Earth. Got that covered. Um, that's not my research area, but I'm, I'm happy that we've got that covered. Um, and what I'll be doing with this data is, uh, because it's so deep, we'll be able to use those techniques I was talking about to map out the dark matter. We're going to be able to see how that dark matter is changing and evolving with time so we can confront these different dark energy theories. I'm um, going to combine it in with other data of how um, galaxies are moving in these environments so we can also test gravity theories. Um, it's going to be an exquisite data set, so watch out for that over the next 10 years uh, as it builds up its data in this amazing um, image of the universe. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas.
a AI TV.